Okay, welcome to Family Bible Time. I'm the camera queen and this is the sleepy queen and I don't know what kind of queen are you? The princess, pampered princess, I think. Anyway, here we are. We're in 2 Samuel 11. Always makes us sad, doesn't it? We're in 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, which always makes us glad. So we'll go from sad to glad. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise and thank you that your word contains all the different human experiences and that you didn't allow sinful men to edit out their, their sinfulness in your word. Lord, we praise you that you've allowed us insight into the depths of the depravity of even righteous people like David. Lord, we pray that you'd help us not to be naive about ourselves or others. And Lord, please lead us in paths of righteousness, deliver us from evil, even our own. Lord, we pray that you would lead us in the truth and teach us and equip us in Jesus' name. Amen. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab. Now, I reckon, having been here in Israel for a little bit later on, I reckon they go out in spring because it's too hot in summer. That's just my opinion. I'd like to know that. Um, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem, remained at Jerusalem, which... <clears throat> a lot of people have pointed out was his first mistake. Um, it happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? Now, already David had, David had more than enough wives, didn't he? <laughs> Two is more than enough, by the way. One is enough. Uh, one is not more than enough. One is just perfect. Um, but two is definitely more than enough. David had several now he sees someone else and she's introduced to him as the wife of Uriah the Hittite. In other words, not for you, David. So David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him and he lay with her. Now that's abbreviated, isn't it? Um, there's been a lot of debate about this passage really brought about by a new emphasis on the impact of um, that power has in relationships. There's a lot of stuff going around in academic circles and in social thinking circles about power dynamics in relationships and people have sought to excuse Bathsheba on the basis that she, you know, she really had no choice. I mean, if the king calls for you, you don't have any choice but to lie with him. Well, I'm sorry, I'm not buying that one moment. It takes two to get pregnant unless David um, raped her, which is not part of this account. Um, it, it took both of them to have this affair. Um, the Bible doesn't hide the fact when God's people sin, and and so I don't I don't personally buy into the idea that this was a forced um, a forced intercourse. But anyway, she came to him and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, Send me Uriah the Hittite. 
And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Why, why do you think he's doing that, by the way? He's trying to get Uriah to go home, sleep with his wife, so that they can cover up the reason for the pregnancy. Go home and wash your feet. Um, and Uriah was... And Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with, the, with all the servants of his lord, and did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah dwell in booths. And my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house and to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Which kind of paints Uriah in a very good light, doesn't it? He's an honorable man. He's, this is someone who's, who, who has great, a great sense of honor honor and loyalty both to God and also to his fellow soldiers and he just couldn't dream of going and enjoying himself that's a very unselfish guy um, and willing to even turn down the king then David said to Uriah remain here today also and tomorrow I will send you back so Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next, and David invited him, and he ate at his presence and drank, so that he made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning David wrote a letter to Joab, and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him, that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite also died. Then Joab said, sent and told David all the news about the fighting and instructed the messenger, when you finish telling all the news about the fighting to the king, then if the king's anger rises and he says to you, why did you go so near the city to fight? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, the son of Jerobesheth? Did not a woman cast an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died at Thebes? Why did you go so near to the wall? Then you shall say, Your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent him to tell. The messenger said to David, The men gained an advantage over us and came down against us in the field, but we drove them back to the entrance of the gates. Then the archers shot at your servants from the wall. Some of the king's Servants are dead, and your servant uh, Uriah the Hittite is dead also. And David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this matter trouble you, for the sword devours now one and now another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it, and encourage him. Then the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead. Sorry, when the wife of Uriah heard that her husband, Uriah, was dead, then she, she lamented over her husband. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house. And she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Wow. Now this is a this is a fearful 
insight into how even believers can behave. What happens when we sin? When we sin like this, we're acting as if God is not watching, aren't we? So when, when, when David sins like this, he's, he's effectively behaving like an atheist. He's, he's behaving as if God is not going to see, if, as, as if God is not going to discipline. He's behaving as, a, we would say, a practical atheist, and it's really, really terrible. But it's what you do, it's what I do, if we sin and override our consciences. Um, God disciplines, doesn't he? Thankfully. Thankfully. <laughs> oh, you want God's discipline, don't you? Because you don't want to walk this path unhindered. If you, if you love God, if you, if you hate your sin, and you see in yourself the potential to walk in this path, you need to do what I have done many times and said, Lord, I am so stupid and so stubborn. I could do this if you don't change me, if you don't restrain me, if you don't make me fear you. This is one way, by the way, that we fear God is by reading his word and thinking about this and thinking that God will deal with me like God dealt with David if I don't repent. So... Um, you know, be beg God to deal with your stubbornness, the stubbornness of your sinful flesh. It's just fearful how low we can go if the Lord doesn't restrain us, if he doesn't save us from ourselves. Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, thank God he does restrain us from ourselves. Um, Paul 2 Corinthians chapter 4, is defending his apostleship. The way to remember that, if you're young, it's is to picture a ship called the Apostle, and Paul's standing on the bridge and he's defending it against all the attackers, the pirates trying to board the ship, the apostleship. He's defending his apostleship. It doesn't even make you smile. That's terrible. You must be very tired. Okay. My dad jokes are wearing a bit thin. I need some new ones. So if you could just, in the comments below, send me some dad jokes. But obviously not working now. She's 14. Grand old age of 14. <laughs> just, just dad jokes are wearing off. Okay. Um, anyway, he's defending his apostleship. And... He's, he's, he's been saying in, in chapter 3, he's been saying that our sufficiency is from God. God has made us sufficient. And, and we get to be transformed as we behold the glory of the Lord. And now in chapter 4, he's going to talk about his fragility, but the reality of the treasure that he's got. So the treasure is the ministry. Look at verse 4. Therefore, having this, uh, chapter 1, in, uh, verse 1 in chapter 4. I'll get there eventually. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. He's going to say that again in verse 16. We do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful and unhanded ways, and we refuse to practice cunning or to temper with the God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Isn't that good? By the way, you, you really wish, I really wish, that so many modern preachers that hit the headlines and end up in the, in the eye of the camera would actually just follow this, the open statement of the truth. There are some people out there, Christians in the media, you would say, if you ask them, like, is homosexuality sin? And they, they take half an hour to answer. And when they finally get there, you think, did, did they say yes? I think they said, yes, it is sinful. Instead of just a straightforward, is homosexuality sinful? Yes, the Bible says so. 
But here we go. Paul's way. Can we, can we just say the biblical way? The example that we're given here is, is we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience by the open statement of the truth. We need to be plain speakers. We can't be beating around the bush. I know that's British, but it's not biblical. Verse 3, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Who's the God of this world, by the way? Who is the God of this world? No, well, what, who's he talking about? Has blinded the mind. Actually, the God of this world is, is with a little g. Look at verse 4. The God of this world. Who do you think it's talking about? It's not Jesus. Did you answer already? I know. Okay. What do you think? Satan. Satan. Yeah, you're right. The God of this world. Sometimes he's called the prince of the power of the air. But here he's called the god of this world. Do you remember when Satan was tempting Jesus and he said, all this authority has been given to me and I can give it to whomever I choose. When you bow down and worship me, I'll give, I'll give you the kingdoms of the earth, basically. And that's the reality, actually, is Satan is is the one who is the power behind this world. And he has done a good job of blinding the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Verse 5, For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants. For Jesus' sake, for God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So hold on a minute. Satan's blinded the minds of unbelievers, but God shines light into our hearts, those of us who believe. It's God who shone the light. It actually takes God to reveal God to us. Yeah, and so it's, it's, a, it's a supernatural act. And the wonderful thing, isn't it, when you have received the light, as it's called here, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Wow. But, that's quite a treasure, but we have this treasure, verse 7, in jars of clay. So we possess the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. That's quite a treasure, but it, we're, we're, we possess that treasure in, in, in our bodies, and we are frail, we're weak. Jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. So a weak vessel, a jar of clay, is easily broken, isn't it? Uh, and so if we're not broken, it's because God is supporting us. Verse 8, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. What's he saying? He's saying that, that we're always suffering, 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 suffering in all these different ways, and we're just weak. We're just jars of clay. Well, that proves, doesn't it, that the power comes from God and not from us. Verse, el verse 11, For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed and, and so I spoke, we also believe and so we also speak. Knowing that he who raised Jesus the Lord will raise us also 
with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. He's saying, I, I, you know, I, I just, I know that God is going to raise me from the dead. And so I, I just speak what I believe. So it's back to the same idea as of the plain statement of the truth, the open statement of the truth. He's saying, I'm, I'm, I'm just a weak vessel. I'm easily crushed. I'm hard pressed on every side, but I'm not crushed. Why? Because God is supporting me. So I just speak the truth. I just speak. I, 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 I just tell you, I, I believe it, and so I speak it. And, and the fact that I'm near to death and, and yet not, not killed is just because God wants me to be alive. Verse 15, for it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So he's saying everything is for your sake. I'm kept alive for your sake. So, verse 16, we do not lose heart, though our outer nature is wasting away. Our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So here we go, we don't lose heart. Even though we're fading away on the outside, even though we're hard-pressed, even though we're struggling, even though it looks like we're going to die, says Paul, we don't lose heart. Why not? Because all these light momentary, he calls them light momentary afflictions. You wait till you get to chapter 11 and 12 and he lists them all. You're going to be going, well, whew, that seems heavy to me. But Paul just considers it all light momentary because... God is bringing him to glory. And, and he fixes his eyes, on, not on the things that are seen, but on the things that are unseen. He's thinking about heaven. He's thinking about the things that are eternal, and so should we. Very simple, isn't it? Um, how to have a ministry where you're not intimidated by the God of this world. We are not intimidated by being handed over to death and suffering like Paul did. Well, it's by fixing your eyes on the things that are unseen, which are eternal. And by realizing that it is God's power that preserves us. We're totally indestructible until the day that God gives the decision for our destruction. <laughs> So our greatest fear should be offending him. We'll see that in David's life. It's horrendous, you know, to, to see David. He's up, 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 up. He can do anything. He can defeat anyone until he sins. And then the Lord disciplines him and he's in real trouble. So we should fear that more than anything else. Lord, we pray that you would help us to fear you, to fear offending you more than anything Forgive us our sins, please, Lord. Lead us in paths of righteousness. Help us to walk in the Spirit. We know that if we do, the surpassing power will be shown to be from you and not from us. As we are preserved and you are glorified, so we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can be the camera queen now. I did... I did the camera king business maybe at the beginning, so you can be camera queen. We'll say bye bye. We'll say lahitra art. We'll say laila tov, and see you soon. <laughs>